Hey there, I'm Kevin Skinner. I'm the student pastor here at First Baptist Watauga. I would invite for you to join our student ministry every Wednesday night in person at 6 p.m. for some games and for our midweek student ministry worship service. Our student ministry has a simple vision. Understanding that Jesus is the difference in our lives, we want to live the difference, share the difference, and make a difference. And I would invite you to join us in that vision. Now stick around, and I hope that you're encouraged by this recent midweek message. So as we dive into tonight's message, let me review real quick. We've been going through Undeniable Joy, and we, you know, last week we looked at the first half of chapter 3 in our study through Philippians. And, and to remind you once more, our working definition of joy. So our working definition of joy is right here. Joy is that good feeling of peace happiness, and contentment that comes from the spirit that is at work within us, regardless of the circumstances that are at work around us. That's the definition that Kevin has said about 15-ish times to you, and I say again to you tonight, and that's, that's what we've been looking at and trying to discover. And the last week's chapter in particular is, Matthew reread some of the verse for us earlier, which is perfect. It, it's We discussed the surpassing worth, the value of knowing Jesus, and about how everything else in comparison is like, Poop, which is the word that Kevin loved to use. Yes, he used the word poop so much last week. We got a real kick out of the fact that he was using the word poop and the fact that he could say it 50 times, just poop, 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 over and over again, so much so that I was curious how how much I could say the word poop tonight. But we're going to stop there because I'm pooped. And in tonight's passage, we're going to explore questions about moving forward in truth D- uh, and and perhaps how we might attain undeniable joy despite the difficulties of being human. So let me read the the rest of the the chapter for us, just a few verses here, and it'll be up on the screen so you can read along. Uh, Chapter 3, starting in verse 12, goes like this. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. And thus ends chapter 3 of Philippians. And as we walk back through that passage tonight, I want to start off and say that I understand that it is difficult sometimes to be a Christian. And not that we're constantly day in and day out facing the same kind of persecution as the early chirps, but perhaps some of you have accepted Christ as your Savior before, and you've since made some mistakes. And you're quite aware now of how imperfect you are and how likely it is that you'll make more mistakes. And that can be demoralizing. Perhaps you faced other Christians who are mean <laughs> or just jerks. Perhaps they demoralize you, they discourage you, right? And perhaps you just had bad experiences with either other Christians or the church in general, perhaps any of those things struggling in the past or still in the present, they're still continuing to happen. Perhaps you're making the same mistake over and over again. And and to those of you who are struggling in some way with the past or things that continue to happen today that have been happening for a long time, I want to share with you a valuable quote uh, from a character in a movie I enjoy. And this character is known for making profound statements in, in his movies. And, and I actually, quite often, I, I find him very relatable, and I enjoy this, this uh, character very much. Let me read you the quote, and, and then we'll put up uh, 
the quote, and you can see who it is. It says, you got to let go of that stuff from the past because it just doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you choose to be now. Now, that's a profound sentiment. It was spoken by Poe from the movie Kung Fu Panda 2. He was speaking to the villain Shen, who was confused with how Poe was able to beat him after he had already done so much to him. You see, he had wiped out his whole family. I mean, he had really put Poe through the ringer, and he's like, does none of what I did bother you? Like, in order to beat him, he had to find peace, and he was able to calm down in the midst of everything that had happened. And you see, we find in Philippians here, Paul saying a very similar thing. Move on. He does not dwell on the past, but he reaches forward for the goal ahead. And you should understand, Paul has got plenty of reason to dwell in the past. It'd be very, very difficult to be a prominent leader in the Christian world when you are so popular for killing Christians. This was his legacy. He was destroying the church before he was leading it. How do you come back from that? Jesus can tell you, you're okay, and, and I've saved you, and my grace has covered you, but it's still hard sometimes to grapple with the fact that those were mistakes and people died, right? I may have mentioned before that last summer our family got a dog, a golden retriever named Bailey. Um, yes, Bethany loves Bailey. Um, I like went traveling and I came home and they'd replaced me with a dog. So imagine how I feel. But this dog is wild. I mean, I've never seen such a wild, insane creature. Jonathan, do you admit it? Like she's nuts, right? There is no calm in this dog. No such thing. And it, like many dog owners, we took her to get fixed, right? Because we didn't want, I mean, once we saw how wild she was, we didn't want hundreds more of her. No. And we, I mean, we don't have the energy, Connor. Don't. We can't. <laughs> anyway, but when she came home from the vet that day, she had this cone around her head, right? Yeah, the doggy satellite dish, right? Now, this was to protect her, really, because we don't want her biting at the scar where they just did surgery, right? Because she can bite those stitches out or she can get an infection and we can't just tell her, we can't give her any command that she'll follow, right? So we really can't tell her, don't bite that. She'll bite everything, right? I, I've seen her chewing on her leg before, haven't you, Jonathan? It, it's weird. So that cone is to protect her from herself and she also came home that day with like all this medication still in her system, right? Because you have to put a dog under before you do surgery. And so she comes home and she's kind of like hung over. I mean, she's messed up. And so this dog that's wild is like walking around the house like a zombie and then just everywhere. And I'm like, Bailey, Bailey, you okay? And she's just and then like her food bowl, which she demolishes every, before it hits the bowl. She demolishes that, right? Well, that night bowl's full and she just stares at the wall. I, I couldn't, I, Bailey, you all right? I mean, she was just, it was crazy. And, and then we're, we're sitting on the couch for the next day or two. We would, we would hear her coming. And so we were, we'd just be sitting there on the couch and we'd hear a dunk, dunk, dunk. And we're like, what is, we turn around and it's Bailey trying to get in the room. Basically she hit the side of the door with the cone, no peripheral vision, I guess. And, and she just dunk. Dunk. I'm like, so someone's got to get up. She won't figure it out. We got to get up and go over it. Go around. There you go. And then she'd go and she'd make them about five feet, get stuck on the couch. Dunk. 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 And I'm like, gosh, this dog. And, and so every time she had to be unstuck. See, Bailey was this normally very absurdly happy, wild creature, loud barking and everything, and now she was quiet, she was slow, and she was stuck. You see, students, undeniable joy, like the joy that Bailey had, is lost when we let ourselves live in the past and let it infect our present and our future, and we end up stuck just like Bailey. Can't, can't get through a door, can't get around a couch, and, and that's unfortunate. How do we ensure that we don't get stuck again, though? All right, we shouldn't live in the past like that. But let, let's take another look at verse 16. We see something interesting here. See, Paul says we should live up to whatever truth 
we have attained. Now, I, I, I want to make something clear here because when I first read this, and I, it kind of threw some red flags. I'm like, wait, what? And I had to go back and read it and look at it. And so I want to make clear, he is not saying here, live your truth. And we've heard that phrase before, right? Only just recently, live your truth is kind of a popular phrase that's come only recently in our culture, right? Live your truth. Whatever you, you believe, whatever is true for you is true for you, but maybe not for me, but maybe not for Ian, but it's true for you. Live your truth. That is not what Paul's saying. That idea came out thousands of years later, right? Paul is certainly not talking about that. We, in fact, we did a series this summer entitled Truth and Hope, where we talked about that. We looked at another letter by Paul, and we discovered in that series, if you remember, students, if you were there, that truth can only be found in Jesus, right? And with that being said, Paul here is simply saying not to live your truth. He's saying to live the truth, whatever truth we have attained. You see, right before that, he's talking about really any, anything that you don't, you know, you disagree with, like God will reveal that to you, right? So he understands that there's a learning curve to Christianity. Praise the Lord, there's a learning curve, right? Because we typically all get it wrong. And, and we continue to learn new things about Christ. And what's important is that as we learn new things, we, we can't do nothing about that. Don't learn something new about Christ, students, and then do nothing about it. Dwell on that. Let it change your behavior. When you learn something new about Christ, let that change you inside. Because the truth about Christ is transforming. You can't hear it and, and be unchanged. And so Paul's here, simply here just trying to say, live up to it. Be a Christian, right? You know the truth that is in Jesus. Let us live up to whatever level that you figured out, right? From the baby Christians to the mature ones who are actually still just baby Christians in disguise, by the way. Just live the truth. Ultimately, this, what he's hinting at here is, is more like live the difference. And I think we've heard that one before. That's one of our main themes here. So if we were to have undeniable joy, which is given to us freely in our, with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, when when we enter that relationship, that joy is now attainable. We can have access to that only through Jesus by living out the truth. But we have to forget what is behind. We have to reach forward. We can't let the things of the past just continue to weigh us down. We must live the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, there is something in that quote earlier that I, I just want to I'll briefly read the quote again to you so you can hear something else I want to point it out to you. This is Poe from Kung Fu Panda. He says, you got to let go of that stuff from the past because it just doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you choose to be now. Well, that's very interesting to me, okay? And, and here's why. This seems to strike at something that I've been learning about this week. Um, as you have all gone back to school in one form or another, um, I have also gone back to school. So you can con congratulate me now because I'm officially in the 17th grade. And I'm still going strong, and sometimes school never ends. But um, one of the things I've been learning in my, my class on youth ministry was that culture lately for, for students and youth like yourselves seems to be based upon this idea that we need to be true to ourselves and find out who we were meant to be. And so we're pursuing this kind of internal quest over who, who we are, right? Now, I don't know what I think of all that yet, right? I'm just learning. I don't have to have answers to that right away. I'm still learning about it, right? And, and I, I do sense that there's some truth in there, right? I mean, perhaps not at all, but perhaps that strikes a chord with you. And if if you really are out there trying desperately simply to discover who you are, let me at least share this with you, that, that it was never meant to be a lone internal quest. That was never meant to be done by yourself, ever. From Genesis, we hear it is not good for man to be alone. He certainly doesn't want us on this quest by ourselves. Let's look at verse 17 again. Now, in verse 17, he says, 
Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. See, Paul has made clear, actually, throughout the entire book of Philippians, you can go watch some of the midweek playbacks to catch up a little bit or, or read uh, Philippians, but you'll, you'll learn that Paul's really big on Christian examples, right? We, we had that whole section on honor your leaders uh, a couple weeks ago, and, and so Paul's concerned that you need to be looking to these examples, right? Now, I know that that is difficult these days, especially difficult these days, because it seems like every other day we're finding out about some new Christian leader who has failed in some spectacular way and fallen. And that's hard for us to, to continue falling. I once had to encourage a student during a, a D now that was at some other church, and the student was afraid because the pastor that he had who had led him to Christ, that pastor had then fallen in some pretty big sin. And he was concerned that somehow his salvation was unstable now because it had come from someone who had fallen so far. And that is, your salvation is tied to no human person. Your salvation is tied to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord, because every human Christian leader will fail right? We are, we are up here battling the same things, trying to let go of the past and reach for it and make, make right what we get wrong, right? And, and just because Christian leaders fail, it doesn't mean we get to stop trying. We still need to try here, right? We can, we can still pursue Christ together. We can still figure out who God is calling us to be. And as far as the internal quest is going, I don't know, right, if you're out there struggling to find out who you are. Sometimes in the Baptist world, we like to call it our calling, right? And so, yeah, yeah, I know I belong to Jesus, right? That's the answer, right? Who are you? You belong to Jesus. That's who you are, right? And that answer sometimes leaves us discontent. It shouldn't, but it does sometimes because we're like, I, I get it, but, but what do I do with my life, you know? What do I do with it? Well, you belong to Christ. You do whatever Christ asks of you, right? And that's hard to figure out. Calling is hard to wrestle with. But we were never meant to wrestle with it by ourselves. One of my favorite all-time movies is titled Return of the King. It is the third movie in the Lord of the Rings series. Thank you, Connor, for the shout-out. It's Wonderful movie series and very, very long. I cannot for the life of me convince Kirsten to sit down and watch the whole thing. She just refuses. And I understand. <laughs> um, but it, it revolves around really two characters, right? The scene, the, the end of Return of the King, there's a particular scene with two characters, Frodo and Sam. And they're kind of some of the main characters of this entire story, right? Matthew's throwing a fit back there. He's so excited. <laughs> Frodo... He's got one goal from the very beginning of the first movie. It's, it's here's, a, here's a ring. It's bad. We need to throw it in a volcano. It's, pretty, it's, it's as simple of a plot as you get, ladies and gentlemen. Ring needs to go in the volcano. Can you get it there, right? So he's got to travel across this land and fight all kinds of crazy things. And after three very, very long movies, if you watch the extended editions like Jonathan and I do, and much, much adventure, you eventually get to this place where Frodo and Sam are on the side of this volcano trying to climb up this volcano just so they can get the ring and the fire, destroy it, good guys win, boom, we can roll the credits, right? But Frodo collapses right here at the end of the movie. He collapses on the side of this mountain. For first-time viewers, it's very confusing. He's done. I mean, you, you listen to the little conversation him and Sam are having, and it's, it's clear Frodo is dying. He's exhausted, dehydrated, and dying. And you see, all throughout the story, the ring becomes a really good analogy for sin, right? Because the burden is heavy, but it corrupts anyone who carries it, this ring, and it, and it threatens to destroy anyone who dare put it on. It's tempting from the very first sight of it. All throughout the, the movies, Frodo's actually having to fight off people from taking it from him. People claim to be taking it for good, but they know that it will corrupt them and some of them don't know, and they have to be fought off, right? Because ultimately, while the ring promises great power, it, it will betray anyone who wears it. So here, then, you can imagine, after three very long movies, Frodo having this ring the whole time, it has taken its toll. It has tempted him. It has just nearly destroyed him in multiple ways. 
And so here he's struggling to bear the weight and he can't do it anymore and he collapses on the side of this mountain. And it is here in this moment when Frodo collapses and he can go absolutely no further that we get probably one of the most Christ-like sentences in the entire series. And it comes from Sam. And Sam says, Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. That's pretty powerful if you give it a moment. See, it was Frodo's quest. Only he is allowed to carry the ring. That becomes clear throughout the movies. It will destroy anyone else. Only Frodo can carry it. That's the story. That's the quest. It's Frodo's quest. And Sam is not allowed to carry it. Sam can't do it. Won't work. But Sam here does a thing that is truly Christ-like. To carry one another up the mountain. And he does. He carries them all the way up the mountain, right into the volcano. Thankfully, he doesn't toss Frodo in along with the ring, although we wonder for a minute if he's going to. But he carries him right up the mountain. And to carry one another up the mountain in pursuit of Christ is how in many ways we live the truth. And living the truth is what provides us with undeniable joy. So if you're here tonight and, and you're struggling with a quest for yourself, maybe as, as, as Matthew comes back up, we're going to sing another song, and perhaps you're struggling to let go of the past or old sin that's still haunting you or mistakes that you were just making all the time now. Same mistake even, right? Habitual sin. It's time to get unstuck. You need to reach out to others so you can forget what is behind. You can reach forward to what is ahead. It's only by doing that that you can... You can live the truth and, and obtain the promised victory, which is guaranteed you your calling in Christ, right? We are citizens of heaven. You can only have undeniable joy when you live that truth, which is your calling, which you can't figure out on your own. You need others. You need to reach out. You belong to Christ. Accept him. and He will transform you. He'll help you destroy the sin. He will keep taking it from you if you will only give it to him every time it comes up. And I'm not saying that you will never sin again, but when you sin, learn from it. Don't make the same mistakes without learning from it. Employ new strategies for how to do it, and that is best really only possible with another Christian by your side. Carry one another up these mountains that is how Christ provides each of us strength. He uses us, guys. So if you're struggling with that, come talk to Kevin and I, the adult volunteers. We are here for you. We want so desperately to, to help you carry these, these burdens that we've based our whole livelihoods on it. This is what we do, just to learn and to help carry one another. So tonight, as we sing this last song, think about that. If you just need to come talk to us, come talk to us. Don't wait. Come pull us aside afterwards, right? We'll talk with you. That's fine. We need to help each other. We need to be willing to accept help. Let's pray. I hope that you were encouraged by this message today, and I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our student ministry, if you need prayer, or if you'd like to make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, head on over to fbcwatagaorg slash students, scroll down towards the bottom of that page and you'll see a place that you can send me a message directly. My desire is that you would experience the difference that Jesus makes in your life this week.